please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Two budget airlines become one. Rising competition in a tough environment drove the merger of Scoot and Tiger Air. But how much will integration help spread its wings? I check in with CEO Lee Lixin on this week's Managing Asia. The synergies from the cost savings obviously are the most uh, immediate gains that we could make. The simple sheer increase in volumes from the combination of the two airlines. So we did manage to squeeze out those savings. Founded by Singapore Airlines, budget carrier Scoot first took the disguise in 2012. Former rival Tiger Airways joined the family as a subsidiary in 2014, becoming fully owned by Singapore Airlines two years later. By July 2017, integration was complete under one banner. It was a move purely a move to strengthen SIA's position in the low-cost carrier segment? Yes, very much so. I think both Tiger Air and Scoot were relatively small airlines at the time. And we knew we needed to scale up fairly quickly. And the best way to do so was through the merger. Lee Lixin had led Tiger Air's turnaround before the merger. A veteran with more than 20 years of aviation experience, he was assigned to pilot the newly upsized Scoot. I think in any merger, the biggest challenge is always about people. Uh, in terms of the actual operations, you can follow a set playbook, uh, but people's uh, emotions are the hardest thing to manage. And that would be the case, I think, for any two companies that come together. Let's talk more about that, because in terms of culture, I understand Scoot is more relaxed, more fun, whereas Tiger Air stuff, and which includes you, a little bit more traditional corporate. How do you bring together two very different work cultures and mindsets? I think from the very beginning, it was clear that we were going to continue forward with the Scoot culture. Uh, as of course, at time as, as it played out, we also adopted the Scoot brand over the Tiger brand. So that was quite apparent to everyone in terms of our overall objective. Now, as to uh, how people adapted to it, it's a question of time, you know, for myself as well as for every other Tiger Air person coming into the merger as well. You're not usually in jeans and a scoop polo t-shirt. Have you gotten used to the uniform? Oh, it's been more than one and a half years, so I'm quite used to it by now. Do I don't have a business shirt in my wardrobe anymore. <laughs> What is it about the Scoot way of doing things that you try to keep? Can you give me an example? For that, I would go back to really uh, Scoot's core values, uh, which we try to live and breathe every single day. So, you know, we try to sum it up in a few uh, elements. We want to be different. Mm -hmm. We want to have a very open culture. We want to have a rewarding culture. And we want to empower our people. But I think we've, we've uh, come a long way. Mm. Since do you remember the, the day you were named CEO of Scoot? Yes, I do. What went through your mind? Of course. Were you surprised I was that you were chosen, <laughs> not Campbell Wilson? <laughs> this, this is a decision, of course, made by uh, Singapore Airlines top management. And, and so uh, I do not have any insight as to what their considerations were. For each and every one of us, uh, whether previously from Scoot or previously from Tiger Air. The, this experience is something that everyone will remember for the rest of their working careers. Mm -hmm. Not many people go through this, mm -hmm. and the fact that we've managed to go through it and thrive coming out of it, I think that's uh, credit to, to everybody's uh, perseverance mm -hmm. uh, and everybody's uh, efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been about one and a half years. Do you think you've completely won over the hearts of school employees? I try my best every day. I don't think I've gotten 100% yet, but I hope I'm getting there. Besides unlocking synergies, Lee wants to take the business beyond. From digitization... In more areas of analytics, to be able to engage with our customers better. To going full throttle on long-haul routes, 
a lucrative sweet spot that's taking off with low-cost carriers. With our 787s, we have expanded our long-haul network significantly and with that, create an overall network rather than just flying point to point. You now fly to 63 destinations across 17 countries with a fleet of about 40 aircraft. In terms of fleet size and routes, how big a budget carrier do you want to be to compete with other low-cost rivals? We do have very aggressive growth plans. What is aggressive? We want to double our fleet size in five years. And so I think that gives you 18. a sense of uh, the order of magnitude uh, of both aircraft as well as network. Will you be able to achieve that sooner? A five-year time frame for doubling of fleet size already translates to about a 15% growth every single year. And that takes a lot of effort. Uh, it takes a lot of guts uh, to be able to do that. I think it is already a very aggressive plan. Mm. What sort of investment are we talking about? Uh, in terms of uh, aircraft, obviously, uh, it is significant sums of money. Uh, but it really depends on how we go about financing them. So it may not mean the full asset cost of all of those aeroplanes uh, because there are ways to get different kinds of financing. Mm -hmm. In terms of people, obviously it would mean literally doubling of at least the operating crew, which are the pilots and the cabin crew. Uh, on the backroom side, maybe not as much, but generally speaking, a lot more people mm -hmm. would be needed. What new destinations are you exploring? Well, we did make an announcement last year when we first came together in the merger about five new destinations, mm -hmm. of which four have already been implemented. Mm -hmm. At that time, it was uh, Honolulu, and then we had uh, Palembang, and we had Harping, and we had Kuantan. For the upcoming year, we've just made an announcement about Berlin, and we're really excited about that mm -hmm. because we started Athens a year ago, uh, and it was our first European destination. And now we are demonstrating that we are serious about being in Europe with our second destination of Berlin. Of course, there will be further new destinations in Asia as well. Uh, and these would obviously include points in the growing markets of China and also Southeast Asia as well. Mm. What about destinations in the US? Is this something you're looking at as well? I would say that Honolulu, which we are already flying now, was really a niche opportunity that we saw. And so we decided to uh, take it up. Outside of that, if you are talking about continental US, we think it will be a little too much of a challenge. Mm. So we probably stay out of it for now. You're part of a partnership that involves seven other Asian budget carriers called Value Alliance. It includes airlines like Cebu Air, Jeju Air, Nok Air. It's this type all about coming together to really give larger low-cost rivals like Air Asia and Jetstar run for their money? I think we are looking at it from the perspective of increasing the market presence for each and every one of the airlines inside this grouping because we recognize that for all of us, we are all single airline base type you know, airlines. So we have a base in Singapore, Cebu has a base in the Philippines. They're very well known there, mm -hmm. we're very well known here. So by leveraging on each other's brand presence, we are possibly able to generate more top line for both of ourselves. Mm. So strength in numbers? Yes. So strength in numbers, does it mean that you can actually outdo and overtake Air Asia and Jetstar? Well, we want to bring benefits to ourselves. I don't think we're necessarily benchmarking against any other uh, companies. In terms of impact on revenue and earnings, how important is this alliance to you? At this point in time is a relatively fledging alliance so we see the potential in it uh, but of course we have not yet ascribed any targets mm -hmm. to what might come out of it of course the sky is the limit as far as uh, our hopes for it are uh, but uh, we don't really have any ascribed targets mm -hmm. when it comes to full cooperation between the seven asian budget carriers whether it's booking seats meals or baggage allowance even check-ins are all the seven airlines already fully aligned at this time no to be very honest one of the things that we discovered uh, along the way as we were implementing uh, some of the specifics mm -hmm. there are many many technical considerations and there's a lot of work involved mm -hmm. before you can truly create a seamless product 
across when can so we many expect different full cooperation? airlines. We're working very hard towards it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I, I, I guess we, you know, we do our best, but uh, at this point in time, we, we don't yet have a, a, a target in terms of timeline as well. Let's talk about this co-chair you have with parent company, Singapore Airlines. What essentially does this mean to you in terms of flights, in terms of bookings, in terms of mileage, in terms of customers? Well, I think that, you know, because we have a network of uh, 63 destinations and actually over 30 of those points are just ours, scoops. Uh, Singapore Airlines does not fly to 30 of the points in our network. So what it offers to the customers of the Singapore Airlines group in general is a much wider product base, which they would otherwise not be able to buy. The code share is relatively new, so the product is relatively uh, in its infancy. We already obviously have sorted out basic elements like uh, provision of news uh, when you buy a Singapore Airlines ticket that's code share on Scoot so mm -hmm. that you don't have to worry about you know, getting news on one sector and not getting news on the other. Uh, there are other details we need to iron out, mm -hmm. for like example, what? on the frequent flyer side of things, mm -hmm. uh, accrual of mileage, we still need to sort out that element. Mm. In terms of impact on revenue and bottom line, what are you expecting from this co-chair? I think that the Singapore Airlines being our parent company, we are obviously hopeful that this will be a fairly big uh, part of our business. And also, Singapore Airlines Group itself, the parent company, being the size that it is, you know, it naturally should give us much more potential. You say you fly to 30 destinations that SI does not even fly to. How much say does SI have in terms of the routes that you want to fly to? Do you try to avoid cannibalization? There is a group uh, network coordination committee, so all route decisions uh, are raised to this committee. But I think you ha really have to look at the actual execution uh, to see what the group's thinking is. Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, one might assume that Singapore Airlines is afraid of cannibalization and won't let Scoot fly mm -hmm. on any of the routes that it does. But as I said before, 30 of our routes are unique points, which means 30 of our routes are parallel points with Singapore Airlines. We fly, they fly. So we are clearly having a strategy which is market focus, customer focus, flying the aeroplane, the product to the markets where there is demand. Mm. And we are not afraid of any potential. Obviously, we wouldn't want to intentionally cannibalize ourselves, mm -hmm. but we wouldn't avoid the possibility of some cannibalization if we felt that overall there was still a gain for the SIA. Mm. So just to be clear, SIA doesn't mind you competing with them directly? We already do uh, they on don't some mind. routes. We already do, and we do on half of our routes. So I think if you think in terms of the uh, scale of how many routes that we are actually operating together, side by side with them, you have your answer. There is always that concern that uh, competitors or market players pump in too many aeroplanes, expand too aggressively on the routes, and that leads to unsustainable uh, operations. Uh, but you. You just have to uh, take it as they come mm -hmm. and manage uh, your own operations as best you can. These days you're not just competing with budget carriers, you're also competing with full service airlines who are also under pressure to cut ticket prices, not to mention the extra capacity coming online as well. Has the survival tactics in the budget carrier business changed over the years? Is it now getting harder just to simply focus on cutting costs? Is there a limit? Life gets harder every day, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the general focus hasn't changed. The discipline on unit cost still has to be there. But I think we go beyond that mm -hmm. uh, because everybody can zoom in on cost cutting as their key strategy. And in the end, you're all the same as each other. Beyond just cost cutting, we want to really have a proposition that customers can feel engaged with and so keep them coming back. And for that, we think about it in four key elements. Uh, value, the number one proposition, which mm -hmm. is the baseline for all budget carriers. But we also think about it in terms of innovation, trying to have new products, products that customers want, 
for example, we were the first ones to come up with a scoot in silence mm -hmm. cabin, uh, which essentially... So you're not allowed to speak? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no young children. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it has turned out to be quite popular, mm -hmm. uh, but of course we welcome young children and young families in other parts of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, the third element uh, I would say is really choice and choice in terms of the growing network that we are implementing, which is why we want to double our fleet size and significantly increase our network. Mm -hmm. And the final element is experience and this is what we've been uh, promoting all these past few years in Scoot, really the different in-flight experience, a little bit from the info informal uh, nature that you spoke of, uh, and also the way our cabin crew engage the customers during their flight. How much lower can ticket prices go? Ticket prices will go depending on how market players behave, mm -hmm. and you, you can't control how other market players behave. But generally speaking, you know, we, each and every airline, including ourselves, we try very hard to find new ways to uh, do things better, to operate more efficiently. And every time we do that, there's an opportunity for ticket prices to go lower. So as long as we are able to continually innovate, you can't really set limits per se. Give me the lowest price you've ever set for a ticket. The lowest prices that there have been for tickets out there for budget airlines have been at you know, nominal levels, if I can use mm -hmm. that term. But it's hard to uh, judge it on its own, uh, to say, how can you make money on a $1 ticket? Or how can you make money on a $10 ticket? Uh, because ultimately, there is very good promotional value to it. And ultimately, when we talk about a route, or a, an aircraft, or a whole network, mm -hmm. you're talking about the average of everything that you bring in. So uh, we don't look at it that way. Mm, but is it getting tougher to make money? Yes, it is. And in part because of the fact that over the past one year, fuel prices have increased. Mm -hmm. um, so if you look at the results that we have reported, we continue to be profitable uh, in the past uh, six months. But at the same time, the profit levels have decreased compared to a year ago. So the fuel price has gone up, that increases our cost, fuel cost being a big proportion of our overall mm. cost. And we've not really been able to raise our fares uh, in response. Mm. Is this something you're watching very carefully, the, the price of fuel? What level in fuel price would concern you? Well, a any increase concerns us mm. because it impacts our bottom line. Uh, but I think for now, uh, we are still able to remain profitable. Mm. Uh, it's hard to say where they might go, how high or how low they might drop. I don't think we are expert in this area, mm. but obviously we will need to adapt uh, our operating plans uh, depending on what happens with it. Mm. Let's talk about your earnings because for the first half of the year, you said you made money and you're truly right because you made five million, all the profits have decreased. How do you expect to do this year, 2018? I think that it is natural that as we embark on such an aggressive growth path, uh, profits may possibly be challenged. And this is simply a function of the nature of the airline industry. You start a new route, mm -hmm. you want to promote it, you want to create awareness, and you do heavy discounting. So typically, they don't make money. Uh, and if you have so many new routes as part of your overall plan, then your profits are going to get affected. So, but I think, you know, we still believe that we have a sustainable business. We have the right business model. So we believe we will continue to make money, um, but perhaps not exponentially more than what we are doing today. According to IATA, China will overtake the US as the largest aviation market by 2022. You already fly to 17 destinations in China. You're looking to add more destinations? Any opportunities related to One Belt, One Road? Yes, definitely we will add more destinations to China. That's very much in our plans uh, as a growth market uh, and with considering the population sizes in many of the even second tier or third tier cities. So that's a very natural uh, outcome for us. With respect to One Belt, One Road, I think we 
uh, we'll look at where those locations are uh, and see where the opportunities are. We already fly to western cities like Xi'an, which is on the Belt mm. and Road, so we will look for more. How many destinations do you want to have ultimately in China? And could it be potentially your biggest market one day? Uh, yes, of course it could potentially be our biggest market one day. We don't ascribe a number uh, as long as there's opportunity for any particular city or route, we will go in.